Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. This is the Super Bowl, World Series, the NBA Championship. This is the moment. So I don't want to slow up the process at all. I'm going to introduce the contest chair, area governor, number uh, area number three, Cheryl Kruger. contest for District 30 for the year 2011. If that's not what you're here for, this would be a good time to go because we seal the doors and there's nobody leaving this room once we get started. I want to thank everybody who is participating in this contest tonight, both as participants and as helpers and volunteers. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to tonight's Toastmaster, a past contest participant who a lot of you have probably seen. Last year, he was the division, Northwest Division Speech Contest Champion in both the Humorous and the International Speech Contests, and the 2007 District 30 Humor Speech Contest winner, Mr. Rudy Segovia. And I was just thinking, you know, I, I was watching the theme, Bridges to the Future. Isn't that beautiful? And I, I remember this one story. It's this 80-year-old woman. She's getting married for the fourth time. And she's marrying a funeral director. <laughs> she gets together with her lawyer. And the lawyer says, get the paperwork ready. The lawyer says, you know, I'm curious. You're marrying a funeral director. What about your first three husbands? And she says, well, the first one was a banker, very successful. The second one was an entertainer, Las Vegas. The third one was a preacher. The lawyer says, really? And, and how did you pick those husbands? She says, I was thinking of my future. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. But it's almost like being the best man at a wedding. I know that no matter what job I do tonight, I'm not going to go home with a prize. But we have some fantastic speakers, and we'd like to get this contest started. And I don't know what happened. I was next to Barry, and he's giving us some kind of an energy. I don't know what it is. That's some kind of a Jedi thing going on. So I'm going to remind you, please, that if you were using your cell phones to put them on silent, to turn them off, I would. That would be better. And once the contest starts, remember, we are going to ask you to please remain in your seats. No, do not go in and out of the room, because we do have our sergeant at arms, and he will not let you pass him by him, OK? Very good, we turn off the So let's get this contest started. Now, I'm going to first give you the, uh, the speaking order. Okay? And that'll be number, contestant number one will be Melody Bird. Number two, Lindsay Danko. Number three, Aisha Ausley. Number four, Denise Jansen. Number five, Connor Kaneen. And six, Dwayne Jackson. Anybody needs me to repeat that? Now, there will be a one moment of silence between each contestant. Timekeeper, when I advise you to do so, please signal me and give me a green light for one minute. 
And after all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given the time they need to complete their ballots. And now we'll begin our international speech contest. Contestant number one, Melody Bird, one daddy, me, me, one daddy, Melody Bird. And 
gave up wholeheartedly supporting me on my damn divorce court. <laughs> I remember my ex-husband asking, baby, why are you so angry? What are you talking about? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Hmm, that made me think. Why was I so angry? I had to go back, way back, to my childhood. I discovered I was still angry at my daddy. I was angry because he wasn't like the daddies on TV. He didn't help me with my math homework at night. He didn't buy me ice cream on the truck on Sundays. He never hung my Father's Day drawing on the wall in 1975. Ladies and gentlemen, I began to realize I had a decision to make. I could continue to hang out with anger and be upset about things from the past that I could do nothing about. Or I could take a different path and get a new best friend, acceptance, and start living a life that I could love. I chose acceptance. First, I had to accept my dad for who he was, a great man who made some mistakes and had some faults, but he loved me. Next, I began to accept others, and eventually, it took a while, I learned to accept myself. In 2005, my dad died from a stroke. He was 83 and penniless even though he had worked the majority of his life. At his funeral, only two of his many friends showed up. When we cleaned his apartment, we found stacks of losing lottery tickets and lapse insurance policies. I remember thinking our time in this life together was quick and unpredictable. But with the help of my friend Acceptance, I was able to get closer to my dad before he died. Now I can do it with me always, right here in my heart. Because of that, we get to talk all the time about my sorority life, about my job as a project manager, and occasionally, we have lunch at McDonald's. <laughs> I can still hear the wise words of my Jamaican mommy. Sweetie, you only have one daddy, you know, just one daddy, so love him, you hear? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what I do. I love and accept my one day. Mr. Chosen. the bad. 
bathrooms, the bathrooms, the toilets. They look and sound like they're going to suck and throw you in a black hole. <laughs> Sitting so close to somebody three times your size, taking up half of your seat. The sounds, the smells, the food cart that blocks the aisle, and waiting forever for the person in front of you to get down their 50-pound carry-on bag from the compartment above before I can get off the plane. Back to my fear. So I'm in the airport, worried that I'll miss my flight, worried that the luggage will get lost, worried that the time will change, and worried that the plane will crash. Once the plane takes off, forget about it. I grip as tightly as I can to the person next to me. My mouth is so dry that I am chugging water, which may make me go into one of those terrifying bathrooms. <laughs> I'm nauseous, my ears are popping, and I cannot shut up. There is turbulence, and I'm almost in tears. I flip through one of the 12 magazines I bought in the airport, but two out of mine to actually read them. I am not a pleasant person to travel with. <laughs> my fear of flying is mostly due to my fear of heights and fear of falling. So I thought to myself one day, what better way to overcome my fear by jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, otherwise known as skydiving. I went tandem skydiving on a nice sunny day. I had my training, received my parachute, and my tandem expert strapped to my back. We piled into the plane, and I was grateful to be towards the back. As we were heading up, my heart was pounding. I was nauseous, dizzy, and I thought that I was going to have a heart attack. I was looking out the window as we were heading up, and the tandem expert strapped my back, back asked, how high do you think we are? I look out again and said, really high? He suggests I took a look at my altimeter, which shows us our altitude. I look, and we're at 3,000 feet. Oh, goody. Only 10,000 more feet to go. you think 
you cannot do. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here as proof that although jumping out of a perfectly good airplane might kill you, that jumping out from behind the podium won't. Mr. Contest Toastmaster. Contestant number three, Aisha Ausley. I know I can. I know I can. Aisha Ausley.
The song, I Know I Can, breaks down a truth in a way that the youth could potentially relate. Nas talks about how we were kings and queens in Africa, how all the races came to us for teaching, and we gave them books and gold and everything was grand. And then when gold was converted into money, it all changed. Now we stand here today, some of us, most of us, with our souls still in chains, <coughs> scared of the world, because of the disparities we face as a result of over four centuries of injustice and oppression. I got to change that. My nonprofit is going to do something about that. My nonprofit first chance has education as the focus, the foundation. But a lot of times education alone is not enough if there's no one there to develop that young mind and nurture it for greatness, to build that bridge over adversity. My nonprofit has needed developmental principles and mentorships, tutoring financial literacy skills, communication skills, conflict resolution skills, all the areas that's needed for that child to grow and be able to survive in this world. But just like that youth needs help, first chance needs help. So what are you going to do? What can you do? How are you going to affect these youth today? Because the truth is, those negative legacies are somewhat present in all of our communities. Can we really allow these demons that have formed and transpired in these young lives to just conquer that potential for greatness? Because it's there, just not tapped into. So I challenge you to do something today. Do something to affect these youth. Because the lost hope in these youth is just heartbreaking and it hurts me to my soul each day. So just imagine your stories, your mistakes, your experiences, your motivation, helping the once troubled youth to rise up and to leave positive legacies behind. They'll be empowered and inspired and be able to rise up and sing and believe. I know I can be what I want to be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be. I'll be where I want to be. Be, be. into the light. From the darkness into the light, Denise Johnson. March 3rd, 2007 is a day that changed my life forever. March 3rd was a day that darkness consumed me. It surrounded me and held me and wanted to suck me into its murky depths. I found that I would never get my way out. That's how I felt that day. Mr. Toastmaster Chair, fellow Toastmasters and guests, March 7, 2000, March 3rd, 2007 is the day my son died, my only child. That's what I felt, darkness. And as I tried to feel my way around, I felt like I would stay there forever. Darkness has a philosophical meaning to people. Has any, have any of you felt like you were in a place of darkness and couldn't get out in any kind of situation in your life? That's what it feels like, hopelessness. But what happens is, is we try to search the darkness. We look into the distance and we see a beacon light that seems to say, come this way. 
Come this way. You can get out of this. One of the most devastating things that can happen to a parent is to bury their child. You don't expect to see that. It seems like it is unnatural. It seems like it's not normal, normality such as it is. You imagine yourself when that time comes that you're surrounded by loved ones and children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, family members, and you're old and family members are in the next room talking about what to do, how they live without you, and possibly who's going to get what. <laughs> but that's what you envision. You envision to reach that age where you get to a year of 90 years old and you are not able to move anymore, but you've served your purpose. And have you left a legacy for those who are surrounding your bed? But the universe has its own idea of what's normal. Because of that, things happen in your life that take you on a totally unexpected journey. And you find yourself in that place, darkness. My family was doing things that normal families do, whoever has a normal family these days. We were living and loving and yes, arguing because that happens in families. All of that changed on March 3rd. 2007. I came home and found my son. And as I reached down to touch his body and he didn't respond, I knew I'd never be the same again. And I cried out to the God of our fathers, why? This is my baby, why? I knew that I would be forever changed. My heart felt like it would never be normally again because this was my child. Somebody felt like, somebody felt like someone snatched my heart out of my body and slammed it to the ground. And as my family surrounded me with loving support, I knew that I would take a new path in life. A new path. But in this, I learned some things. I learned that you don't want anyone to feel what you're feeling at that time. There's an old spiritual that says, nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. <coughs> nobody knows the trouble I see. Glory! Hallelujah. That's what you feel when you go through that. People sometimes think that they're saying the right thing and they mean well, they really do. They'll say, oh girl, I feel so sorry, but you feel normal again. No. Normal was seeing my son every day. Normal was talking to him every day. Normal was sitting down talking to him about what he was doing in his life. Normal was him coming to my house as an adult, as an adult opening my refrigerator and seemingly inhaling because it was empty <laughs> when he left. That was normal. I have what I like to call a new normal. New normal was memories. My favorite memory is when my son was eight years old, he had a love of cars. You know, children like that kind of stuff. Eight years old, anytime you see a car, you get excited. It's like the commercial where these two people are sitting on the bench and this car passes by and they'll say, red one, bam. That was my son. And one day he looked at me and said, Mommy, when I'm 17 years old and you're in a nursing home, <laughs> can I have your car? <laughs> Mommy, I'll make sure you're all right. I just want to drive your car. Now, at the time you were seven, seven years old, I was in my 30s. I didn't think I'd be ready for a nursing home in my 40s. <laughs> but the reality is, I have a new norm. But one thing I know that as you go through a situation like this, there's something called hope. No, not hope that I'll see him again in the physical. I know it doesn't work that way. But there's hope that I will live in this new normal and I'll make something positive of it. Hope that I'll keep the memories of him close to my heart because that was a man that loved me simply because I'm a massive energy that I can find space in this world. Hope that as I go through life, I will be able to tell other people, you can make it. Hope that, as a friend of mine did, she lost her child when she was five years old. Five years old. And what happened, she took that pain and she started an organization that will help other people bury their child if they don't have the money, called Jordan Cares. She stepped out of the darkness into the light. What I plan to do is as I move forward in this new world, in this new normal, I'm going to spread my message to all who will listen. I will encourage other family members who are going through this devastating experience that yes, there's hope. 
Hope that you can have a good life. No, you'll never stop thinking about your child. This is the flesh of your flesh and the blood of your blood. That won't happen. What will happen is you will be able to stand tall and say, I am going to feel better. Not because the child is gone, but because God has prepared for you a way to step forward out of this darkness into the light. And as that person looks to the heavens where their child rests in the arms of Jesus, they'll be able to say, it is well with my soul. Because I know how the world works and I know that I'm still here and I'll be able to move forward and do the things that I need to do and have a positive impact on somebody. I'm going to tell the world. I'm not going to keep this to myself. It's a story to be told. There are people who are going through this who need to know that in this darkness, there's hope. And when they figure out that they can move forward, they'll be able to stand up, stand tall and throw their shoulders back and reach out with hope in their heart and love in their eyes and step from that darkness into that marvelous night. Because I know, because I am. Contestant number five, Connor Kaneen, Mr. Brown's question. Mr. Brown's question, Connor Kaneen. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. Just one day, one day before my ninth birthday, I had been caught for about the fifth time ringing the doorbell of our elderly neighbours, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, and scooting away. <laughs> now, here at my birthday party was Mr. Brown. With a large smile on his face, just one day after the crime, and with a birthday gift for me. I put the book my favourite soccer team, Manchester United. At that age, I was a holy terror. A real scamp who made Dennis the Menace look like a choir boy. <laughs> Just a few days later, Mr. Brown saw me practicing my soccer skills on his prized red roses. <laughs> yes, he got mad. But the next time he saw me, he had that genuine smile on his face again, as he nearly always did, despite my childhood reign of terror. About three years later, when I was 12, Mrs. Brown died. At her funeral mass, my dad pushed me up to her grieving husband. Apprehensively, I offered my hands like the grown-up people did, and Mr. Brown he ruffled my hair, and I cried. I cried not tears of sadness, but tears of regret, because I wanted Mrs. Brown to know that I could be a nice kid, and now she never would. And it never occurred to me that I could be nice to Mr. Brown. Some weeks later, my dad, who was a doctor, and I were walking the cobble streets of our little village when Dad passed money to the local street musician named Top Hat. He wore a top hat, battered and black, that often doubled as a money bag when he played his violin. Top Hat said, thanks Doc, and my dad went, which I thought was really cool, and something clicked. I reached into my pocket and took out a few pennies and passed them to Top Hat, who said, Thanks, Connor. I didn't even know he knew my name. And my dad went, good kid. And I felt really good. Maybe it was because it was the first time in my 12 years I was deliberately nice to someone. <laughs> but I felt really good. And as we walked home and as we walked by Mr. Brown's house, it occurred to me, I could be nice to Mr. Brown. That evening, I rang his doorbell and waited. <laughs> Sir? Can I cut your grass? Yes, kid, you can. Now I felt really good until I realized he only had a push more. <laughs> I cut his 
grass a number of times that year and we started having grown up conversations about really important things, about why Manchester United, for instance, at that time were a really bad team. They really were. And I first heard Mr. Brown's question. During one conversation, Mr. Brown said, Hi, hey, kid. Mrs. Brown, you say, the only reason why I never broke your neck was because you were like me. But you're always smiling, and you never get mad. Well, except sometimes at me. Hey, kid, I do get mad. But when things go wrong, I ask myself one question. And that question is, what do I want my attitude to be? Mr. Brown's question, what do I want my attitude to be? About one year later, Mr. Brown died. And at his funeral mass, this kid cried tears and tears of sadness. During my teenage years, Mr. Brown's question seemed quite profound. On one occasion, when my best friend went off with my girlfriend, my best friend, I asked myself the question, what do I want my attitude to be? <laughs> it didn't help. <laughs> but as I grew into adulthood and into parenthood, I began to realize the importance of Mr. Brown's question, especially when things go wrong. A few years ago, my doctor phoned to say, Connor, you have cancer of the prostate. I put on the phone, googled like crazy to see what it meant. Saw that Amazon had over 4,000 books on the topic. Read that over 30,000 men die each year from prostate cancer in the United States, but a lot more survive it. And having read that attitude is critical in illness, I remembered and I asked Mr. Brown's question. And I said, I am going to beat this. I have previously beaten cancer of the thyroid. I am going to beat this. And so, in June 2007, I walked into Chicago's Northwestern Memorial Hospital for prostate surgery, a prostatectomy, with the right attitude and with a brand new pair of Monty Python pajamas. <laughs> pajamas that bore the legend, it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> My wife says that as I was being wheeled to the operating room, half broke, half conscious, I started singing Danny Boy. <laughs> A song that drives her crazy, that the kids and I only ever sing to drive her crazy. <laughs> but I knew that she was crazy with worry. Hey, the cancer was not a cakewalk. I had sleepless nights, my, life had, my wife had sleepless weeks, but today we sleep easy. When things go wrong in life, and they do, there is not always a good answer. But there is a good question. What do I want my attitude to be? And it's because of Mr. Brown's question I can stand here in front of you and tell you that having had a thyroidectomy and a prostatectomy, I now have an Irish condition known as, there's not much left to me. <laughs> and contest chair, fellow Toastmasters, I would really love to think that somewhere in a better place, Mrs. Brown is nudging Mr. Brown and saying, see, he is like you. Thank 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 Contestant number six, Dwayne Jackson, The Insights of Justice, The Insights of Justice, Dwayne Jackson. instruction and understanding and then one day BAM! You are unexpectedly hit out of nowhere with knowledge and insight that simply blows you away and changes your life forever. I know this because it happened to me 
And this is why I want to share my experience with each of you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and to each of you, our distinguished guests. We all may encounter a point in life when we find ourselves just like the blind, standing at a corner, helplessly waiting for someone to grab us by the hand and guide us from one point to another. Let me introduce you to someone who needed just this type of assistance one day. His name is Justice. Justice was six feet three inches tall, 250 pounds. He had big brown eyes, which he could no longer use for sight. I remember it like it was yesterday. I stood at a, at a busy street corner. I anxiously took a look at my watch and took a deep breath. Because if I was going to arrive to work just one nanosecond late, I was certain to be fired by my new manager. I was three blocks away from my destination, and my plan was simple. As soon as the light turns green, I'm sprinting the next three blocks like I'm on a mission from God. <laughs> as soon as I began stretching, a blind man brushed up against me. And I still remember the first words he said to me. He said, Excuse me, sir, but would you be so kind as to direct me to Madison Street? <laughs> I looked at him in a rather dumbfounded sort of way, and I thought to myself, should I even dare risk being late for work again to help a blind man find his way across the street? He seemed so sincere and in need of my assistance, so I relented, humbly. I locked arms with justice, and as we took our first step, I began thinking of all the jobs I could apply for because <laughs> justice was the slowest walking person I had ever met. <laughs> <laughs> Only two minutes away from being fired, I began to pull justice again, not verbally communicating to him. I have important places to be, and if we don't move faster, we will be tragically killed by the traffic. I was so focused on my destination, I didn't recognize we were approaching an Olympic-sized pothole. <laughs> Faster than I can say the word stop, it happened. <laughs> Boom! Justice went crashing to the pavement. Frozen with embarrassment, I struggled to help Justice get back to his feet. Remember, this is a 250-pound man. Here I am, helping him get from one point to another, and just when I felt he was safely across, he called out to me saying, thank you, sir, for your help, but would you please walk with me two more blocks <laughs> to my actual destination? So for the next 15 minutes, <laughs> Justice and I walked those two blocks. I asked him of his reason for being downtown that day. And Justice explained that he was taking a test to enter law school. Why would someone want to hire an attorney who's visually impaired? Justice said something so meaningful to me that I memorized it instantly. Justice confidently said, yes, I am without physical sight, but now I see inwardly with my heart something that is truly good cannot be seen by the eye alone because good has no form nor figure. And my blindness has caused me to look within myself and I have discovered that my true purpose is to bring justice to, to our world. And I guess this gives further meaning to the saying, justice is blind. <laughs> he said with a chuckle. Justice helped me to realize that the greatest waste in our society is not the waste of time or money, but the greatest waste is the waste of authentic talent and skills. And when this happens, we are just standing at the corner of life, <coughs> completely blind to the endless opportunities that can enrich our lives like never before. But the power to propel yourself forward is within you. And to uncover this, you may have to 
Close your eyes. Forget about your titles. Forget about, forget about what society has created for you. Forget about what your culture presents to you and allow your own natural abilities to direct you. Sadly, I arrived to work 20 minutes late that morning, and who was impatiently waiting at my desk? None other than the new manager. Immediately, I went into my spill about helping a visually impaired man get across the street, and before I can get to the part where I was supposed to apologize, she calmly replied saying, Dwayne, don't apologize for taking the opportunity to be of service. Both of my parents are visually impaired, and I'm happy you understand. When you help someone else, you enrich your own life. Behind her words, I was convinced. It was not circumstance that led me in the pathway of justice that day. It was fate. In retrospect, I can only wonder which one of us was truly the blind man that fate would have. Which one of us possessed the clearest vision about life, about purpose, about direction? I mean, was I uniquely led to that intersection to help a visually impaired man cross the street? Or was that visually impaired man directed to the pathway of my life to give me a greater sense of vision, purpose, and direction that I may have not discovered otherwise? I want to take this opportunity to challenge each of you to open your eyes to the endless possibilities that exist in your life and to open your mind and your heart and perhaps like justice, you'll see your reason for living more clearly than ever before. As Gandhi spoke, to find yourself, you must lose yourself in the service of others. Mr. Postman. Well, I can't beat 
this act. So I will say that I survived a gale storm. I don't know if you know what a gale storm is, but it's when uh, the wind is really high, it's like a hurricane on the lake, and my fiance and I went camping, and there was a gale storm. They suggested we all go home, and the two friends that were with us and my fiance decided to run out by the lakefront in the gale storm to see what happened. And, uh, <laughs> this year and my goal was to skydive but after hearing your story those couple of seconds that the shoot has to know I don't think I can handle that. Congratulations. And uh, same questions, how long have you been in Toastmaster? Since November of 2009. What club are you representing? I'm representing the Craft Foods North Shore Toastmasters Club. And I will be beginning my HCB very, very soon. My elevator speech. The basis of my speech is a real nonprofit that I am in the process of starting. Education is the focus. There will be principles of mentorships, and tutoring, and financial literacy skills, communication skills, conflict resolution skills, exactly as I mentioned. I will have contact forms in the back in case any of you would like to donate, volunteer, be a workshop facilitator, any areas that you can help out. I, it, we are greatly needed and appreciated, so if anybody could give the contact info and be contacting in the future about potential future support, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it in helping the youth of today. Thank you. Everybody. I am representing the speakers of the House Club of the Chicago Housing Authority. I've been a Toastmaster, a Toastmaster for two years and I'm a competent communicator. My elevator speech, okay, you all ready? Okay. Now, the reality is, is that I'm loving speaking, I'm enjoying it, and my goal is to take that message that I gave to you tonight across the world because I feel it is so needed because that's a population that sometimes does not get a lot of attention. Uh, I have five grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. Uh, I try not to cry when I give that speech, but I do that and then I get upset because I ruined a good makeup job. <laughs> I'm 57 years old, it takes a minute to look like this. <laughs> so honored to be with my fellow contestants because the judges had a very hard job to do. Yeah. Thank you. with the certificate of participation. Okay, Connor, another question. Good evening, everyone. Connor, I'm uh, representing Platinum Live Club number 4117. I'm actually uh, working, I would hope to have a second DTM by the end of uh, this year. And I was lucky enough to represent Chicago last year in the World Championship. But I gotta say that each of the speeches that we saw here tonight would not have been out of place in last year's finals. And I mean that sincerely. They were absolutely fabulous. Uh, in terms of my uh, uh, elevator speech, uh, my business card uh, bears the legend Connor Kaneen Cash, C A S H. And that cash stands for a consultant, author, speaker, and humorist. And a cash is also what I like to get from my clients for what I do. <laughs> I, I was originally going to go with the acronym for raconteur, author, speaker, humorist. But I didn't think I should have the word rash on my business card, but I definitely don't want to get that from my clients. Thank you. God is the greatest. Yes, he is. I've been a Toastmaster. 
I joined on my birthday, January the 10th, 2010, so I don't know how many months that is, but I'm part of affiliated with two. I have two Toastmasters homes. One is Chicago Speakeasy. And the other is Bold Literary Talkers. Uh, my 32nd elevator, also I am a competent communicator. My elevator speech, I would say really simply that I want to just thank everyone just for being here and listening to myself as well as listening to the positive people up here. And to don't think that there's any difference between us or anyone else that's doing what you might want to do because you can do it. In fact, you can even do it better so as long as you just follow your heart. And the speech that I gave today, I competed last year with Connor, and it was a great experience. And the speech I gave today, I was thinking for months and months about what I want to talk about, and my mind could not find anything. And this incident happened with gentleman justice, and I just followed my heart. And where I was going that day was to my job to work for a college, <laughs> which I've never made as much money as I made with this college. But once I did get to work, uh, it, it was an epiphany for me where about a week later, I decided to resign from that job. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because it, where, it wasn't where my heart was at. So my message is really simple. Follow your heart. That's where it starts and everything else follows. Yeah. <laughs>